Hey there. Today is the 7th of April, 2022. This is Medusa Was Framed, and my name is Joyce. Today I'm going to revisit a topic that I have addressed before. This is across the street from me. Well, up the block and across the street. The Great Cross of St. Augustine that sits at the Marsh Point on the land of Nombre de Dios Mission and Our Lady of La Leche National Monument. I have a lot of history to read for you, dates and such things, dates and relationships. And I have a lot of slides. So what I'm gonna do is just put this on slideshow and then ramble off some dates and relationships. And then I'll go back slide by slide and talk more specifically about the things that are there. But anyway, so here we go. I'm going to put it on slideshow. And you can just watch and listen as things move. So, history of St. Augustine. There's a lot of it. We are supposed to have been the first settlement by the civilized British Catholic Christian people. Ponce de Leon supposedly getting here about 1513. In 1565, the butcher Menendez de Avila is said to have landed right about here where the cross is here on the marsh land where the Tomolato and the Matandas rivers meet in what is now called St. Augustine. I just want to point out that this has been marshland for a very long time. <laughs> and where the cross now stands could not possibly have been where the edge of the river was in the 1500s, nor could it have been in 1966 when it was erected. But we'll just leave it at that. Anyway, Menendez de Avila came here on order of the King of Spain to get rid of the French Huguenots, the French Protestants that were peacefully, cooperatively, we are led to believe, setting up settlement. Uh, they were happy and appreciative to work with the indigenous people along the, set, the, north, the northeastern coast of what is now Florida and into Georgia, all of that area. They were happy to work with them and appreciated their assistance, didn't try to convert them. They were trying to escape persecution as it was, the last thing they wanted to do was persecute anybody else. They just wanted to live in peace. So anyway, if you're interested about that, there's a lot of history in St. Augustine about the Huguenots, the French Huguenots. And we have a uh, French Huguenot star fort, the remains of it, north of here that I did an earlier video on. It's referred to as Fort Caroline. And um, very interesting, very sad story there, but a little more if you're interested. Anyway, so Menendez came with his five ships in 1565 and according to his journals, set foot on the land. And as soon as he put his foot down on the land, he proclaimed it in the name of God, Nombre de Dios, claimed it as Catholic Spanish land. One of the first things that they did, according to his diaries, was put up a cross of sorts. And um, that day, supposedly, he had a service of some sort on the land there. We are to believe that that cross is where he set foot on the land, just like we are to believe up near the Huguenot star fort of Fort Caroline that where Jean Rebeau put his 
not cross, but column staking claim to the land, that that is where the current Rabo column is standing. Of course, it couldn't possibly be the case. Look at the terrain, look at how much, you know how much water and marsh and rivers changed when they're not terraplaned and this certainly was no exception. But anyway, anyway, the first Franciscan missionaries are supposed to have arrived in 1573. Menendez named his first settlement here on the land you're looking at there as Seloy Menendez. Named such because the leader of the Timucuan who were inhabiting the area was called Siloy. So the first settlement for which there are maps, there's a map here in the slideshow, um, was Siloy or Siloy Menendez. Menendez came here with a mission and was not a very nice guy. And um, if you didn't convert to Catholicism, we're just going to kill you. And that's what he started doing. And so the other indigenous folks, whether they were of the Timucuan tribe or the Queek tribe or what have you, started fighting back. And after being here only nine months, they had to move across the Matanzas River to the area we now call Anastasia Island, where all of the coquina quarries were. The coquina that built the Castillo San Marcos, the city wall, the sea wall, and many of the homes that have survived the several fires that have engulfed St. Augustine over the time. It's not hard to believe that they moved their settlement. But what's kind of hinky about the whole thing is that no remains of this fortification on the island of Anastasia Island um, exist. No remains at all. An interesting side note on that is that in 1993, was it? 1993, there was a New York Times article that proposed that the original first Siloy Menendez settlement the settlement of St. Augustine was not here in Florida, in what we now call St. Augustine, but actually was up in Georgia. Little Raccoon Island in Georgia, just south of Jekyll Island. And if you snoop around and you look for old maps from around that time, 1560s or so, of course, they would have been Spanish or French. You find maps that are very interesting and make you turn your head and question. Also, if you look even today on Google Earth at what this point is where artifacts were found on Little Raccoon Island, the remains of an old fortress. And the way the terrain is now, the way that the sand gathers in dunes, it sounds much more like what the diary entries speak of when Menendez talks about his scouts going out and looking this way and that. There were not sand dunes, 
on the St. Augustine side, there are sand dunes still on Anastasia Island, but uh, wouldn't it be interesting if all of this history, that's the map right there, if all of this history that St. Augustine makes her money claiming is a lie. What if that was the place? That yes, Menendez landed here first. But then when he scooted to move to a safer spot, he didn't just move across the river. What if he moved north into Georgia? which was Spanish territory at the time. That was Florida at the time. And that's where his fortress was. Huh, you wonder, you wonder. Anyway, so Seloy Menendez was a Timucuan settlement and uh, Menendez after less than a year scooted out of there because uh, the angry indigenous people kept attacking the tent and went where he went. Let's just say he went where he went. He went to a barrier island region that had sand dunes. Let's leave it at that. So in 1566, he created another fort, another center that he occupied, and I've talked about this in my video about Fort Caroline. It was then called Santa Elena, and it's on coastal, the coastal portion of South Carolina, what we now know as Paris Island, where another tribute to Jean Rebeau, the leader of the escaping French Huguenots, uh, the leader of that group of people, all of whom were slaughtered by Menendez and his barbarians because they wouldn't become Catholic. Uh, there was a settlement up there as well. So Florida was quite expensive during the Spanish time all the way up to South Carolina. In 1587, we are to believe that the first church was built here on the Nombre de Dios. And at that point, some 20 years after settlement, there were many Timucuin who chose to convert and those that did became a very important part of the organization and, shall we say, administration of the settlement. Um, the most notable was a Timucuan woman who married a Spaniard, and her name is known in history as Doña Maria Menendez. She was of the ruling class of the Timucuan tribe as it was. So for her to be on the uh, European side was a considerable coup for them. And she pretty much ran the place. Uh, you could call her a mayor or a, a governor or some such thing of the area. In 1654 and running through 1655, smallpox decimated a good bit of this settlement. And of course, we know where the smallpox came from. There is a massive cemetery near Fort Caroline, no, near Fort Clinch, excuse me, in Amelia Island, uh, the most northern part of coastal Florida. Um, Fort Clinch is on the St. Mary's River. The southern land of the St. Mary's River is Florida, and the northern land on the St. Mary's River is Georgia. So up there, there is a cemetery from this time, from the epidemic. Uh, lots of unmarked graves and things. 
most of the settlement was wiped out at that time. Now again, see here is where the history gets hinky because are you talking about the settlement that we know existed here at Our Lady of La Leche in St. Augustine? Or are we talking about the settlement that was elsewhere? Was it the one in Little Raccoon Key that is believed to be the actual site of the second Siloy Menendez fortress? Or is it the one in Anastasia Island? Or is it the one here in St. Augustine? See, we don't know. The history is hinky. Anyway, the important thing is, is more than half of the Timaquin natives are believed to have been wiped out in that time. Adding to that, there were hurricanes that did considerable damage, not only to this, but what was standing in St. Augustine in 1597, 1622, 1638, and 1674. In 1687, the official shrine of Nuestra Señora La Leche y Bon Parto, Our Lady of Milk and Happy Delivery, was built here, the first one. It was destroyed three times through fire and conquest. The first one was erected in 1687. The first official one. Before that, it was just a church. It wasn't a church dedicated to Mary. So this is the key point. This makes it the first Marian shrine in the United States and as still celebrated as such. The statue that was made at the time, which no longer exists, was based on a statue of the nursing Mary in Spain. In 1688, <laughs> the next year, the worst pirate attack that St. Augustine suffered occurred from an English pirate by the name of John Sears. And uh, he wiped out most of the people in this settlement and a good bit of the people in St. Augustine as well. In 1702, another English marauder by the name of James Moore came down from the South Carolina British settlement run by Oglethorpe with the indigenous people that conscripted to join and burned what was standing here, burned a good bit of St. Augustine and laid St. Augustine to siege. The people that were living in St. Augustine at the time, which were about 1500 people, we are to believe, took refuge in the Castillo San Marcos, our big star fort uh, for 51 days during that siege. Following that, the Hornbeck was built in 1706. And there's a slide here of a drawing of an additional fortified wall. That's the Hornbeck. I'll point that out when we get to it. But that was built in 1706. Again, that would have been constructed out of Coquina, most likely from the King Quarries over in Anastasia Island, which is across the Matanzas River, about, about a two mile journey uh, over marsh and water to construct. So that was another line of defense, it was a second line of defense. And interestingly enough, there is absolutely no record of any kind standing of the Hornbeck. Um, I live in the neighborhood that would have been protected 
by the Hornbeck. I live across the street from all of this. Um, based on the map that I have in the slideshow that you'll see, I tried to figure out where it would have been and walked the streets, all of which are, are all 1800s protected neighborhood. The homes are all old and lovely. And um, if you work on them, you have to restore them to what would have been their original historical accuracy. There is no evidence at all of this wall, which I find most troubling. Um, it's supposed to have been built on the narrowest part of the peninsula, the peninsula being between the Matanzas River and the San Sebastian River, which is where we live. I found that point now in the current time, and it is the street that's across from the main entrance to all of this, which you've seen in the photos. And it's, uh, I think it's called Mission Street. Um, that is the narrowest part. The San Sebastian River is very close there. And as you can see, when you look at all of these images, the Matanzas comes in naturally and creates a small little inlet here. So I believe that that's where it was. Now in 1728, a Colonel Palmer, another one of Oglethorpe's hooligans came down from the Carolinas once again and attacked St. Augustine and burned everything again, burned everything that was standing here. In 1743, Oglethorpe again attacked St. Augustine, attacked whatever was standing here. There was a very unpleasant truce between 1743 and 1763. And in 1763, Florida was ceded to England in exchange for Cuba. That created another problem. All of the slaves that had sought refuge here from the abuse of the British slave owners in the Carolinas. There, there's the Hornbeck, there's the Hornbeck you see. Okay. Um, they had to scoot when all of this was ceded back to England because they would, the freedom that the Spanish offered them here in exchange for converting to Catholicism and fighting in the army would have been made null and void by the Spanish taking over. So we had a very large population of escaped and freed uh, slaves here that were in an area further south of here called Fort Mose, which I did a video on as well. And they scooted, they went to the Caribbean and they went to Cuba as well. Now in 1783, Florida was returned to Spain in an interesting treaty that gave Gibraltar to England. <laughs> so 1784 to 1821 was the second Spanish colonial occupation. And in 1821, Florida became a state. So let me get this off of the slideshow. And let's just go through the slides and I'll talk about them. So this is the erection of the cross in 1966. I don't have a date on this image. I didn't take it. I stole it from the internet, but I can tell you that this picture was taken from the church standing current church across that water to the cross. This was some time ago, and I can tell not only by the kind of the quality of the photo, but things have changed here around the cross a good bit over the years. And when I talked about the uh, Horn Bank being built at the narrowest part of the peninsula, this is the Matanzas River out here, and it comes in through a little break here. And uh, this is all natural this water here. So it coming in 
this being the Matanzas River and then across was the San, Savan, San Sebastian River. So this was the narrowest point. And so the Horn Bank would have been built there, the narrowest point and no evidence, sadly enough. Okay, this is an aerial photo from some time ago, but you get an idea. This is the land around the cross. It does not look like this now. There's a whole bunch of stuff here now that was not there then. And this is what we now call Anastasia Island or uh, St. Augustine Beach as it's referred to, and it goes north quite a while. Um, and according to the stories that nine months after the encampment here, Menendez took his, his dudes over across the river because the Timucuan were making it too violent and horrible. This is where they are supposed to then have gone, where there is absolutely no evidence of any fort there. This is also the body where the coquina quarries were that were used to build the Castillo San Marcos, our big star fort, um, and the city wall, the city gates, the, uh, the sea wall, and any of the buildings that are still standing from that time, and there are some, uh, that's where that coquina was from another angle and um, you're looking over here at what is now called uh, Ponce de Leon's Fountain of Youth. At the time when this was the Siloy Menendez encampment, this was all part of the encampment. It's just sequestered off by itself because it's, uh, it's another lovely tourist trap. You have to pay, I think 25 bucks to get in here now you can walk on this land for free. But um, now this along here hasn't changed because it's, you know, it's all been seawalled and rip wrapped and such. Um, but this does not look like this now. There's all kinds of creepy stuff down here now. But this is interesting. I mean, you see the marsh and of course, this is a very changing area, very fragile actually easily changed to believe that this is where Menendez put his foot in the 1500s is, is pretty ridiculous, pretty ridiculous. Another shot of the cross. Again, this circular area, that's, that's all here, but uh, this area has been filled with a lot of uh, spooky Masonic, uh, stuff, hence the uh, chosen title. So this is natural here. Just this walkway was built over it, but this inlet of water is natural here. This is this Old Town St. Augustine, where you see all these wonderful red brick roofed Tartarian buildings and the Bridge of Lions crossing over to Anastasia Island. I think I put that in there twice. I apologize for that. You've already seen that one. This is a splendid photo of the cross with the the relocated statue of Father Lopez. This is supposed to be a 1593 drawing of Siloy Menendez. This is supposed to be The area in question. All of this is supposed to be the area in question, what we now call the grounds of Nombre de Dios and Our Lady of La Leche and Fountain of Youth. But if you look, you will see that this is the exact same drawing that is used for Siloy up 
in Little Raccoon Creek in Georgia. So the cross was erected in 1966. And I think some of these photos, that looks like a photo from the 60s or 70s to me, can't tell. Part of the dating is this is where the statue of uh, father was. This uh, granite platform is still here. You come in, you walk over the bridge, and then you go to the cross. This is still standing, but he has been moved. He has been moved, so he's standing right in front of it, and it appears that he's looking backwards over his shoulder at it. And this, to my knowledge, was done in 2011. Um, he was moved in 2011. And you know, it's interesting, I, I, I didn't, um, yeah. I remember him being there. I haven't lived here all this time, but I remember him being there. Anyway, cool photo. Another old photo, I have no idea. Like a postcard. That bridge is still here and you can see. So this was before 2011, pretty obviously before 2011. I think this is from the 70s. And you can see the statues there. And there's nothing out here by the cross, which is how it looked the first time I saw the cross. There was nothing out there but a cross. So here we go. This was all of Florida during the Spanish colonial times, way up here to Santa Elena, which is what is now in the Carolinas. Here's the Castillo San Marcos. That's our big star fort right there. The city of St. Augustine, the fort protected the city of St. Augustine. And Seloy, which is what we were looking at, right? Um, the grounds of the mission and um, what is now the Fountain of Youth, which was part of it at the time. And this is just an indication of here across the river on Anastasia Island, that's where we are to believe that Menendez took his fellows. I think that might be, that's the last one. So what I'm gonna have to do is put it back on slideshow so I can get to the next slide and stop it there. I took that just the other day. That's the cross, okay? And that's the erecting. Okay, now this is very, very, very interesting. Oops. I had to stop it there. Okay, sorry about that. This is very interesting. This is information from the adjacent land, what is now called Ponce de Leon's Fountain of Youth, where Ponce was supposed to have found the Fountain of Youth, which is kind of ridiculous because Florida is one big limestone aquifer. It's all the Fountain of Youth. It's all artisanal water all of it. That's why we have sinkholes and houses that are built where no house should be built falls into a sinkhole because of where we're sitting on limestone lakes. There's lots of artisanal water here. But anyway, now, if you've been to St. Augustine, you've probably been to the Fountain of Youth. It's a wretched, horrible, evil place. Uh, just just disgusting. Um, <sighs> human remains were found there in the 30s. And it, before that time, had already been a schmaltzy place where uh, people were hacking it as the fountain of youth. Um, and, you know, people would come and pay their money and you know, all that 
horrendous nonsense without any consideration or respect for the indigenous people whose lives were destroyed to create all that Disneyland, right? But anyway, so in 1874, a gentleman by the name of Passetti, who worked in construction, stumbled upon this cross in what is now the Fountain of Youth land, the property on which is now the Fountain of Youth. And there was a big hubbub about it. Oh my gosh, this is historically significant. Oh my gosh, this is valuable. Oh my gosh, what does this mean? Well, he just wanted to sit on it quietly. It seems not make it into anything for what reason, I don't know. Maybe it was a good thing, I don't know. Anyway, he covered the cross back up again. And that was the end of that. But in 1900, uh, a successful independent woman by the name of Luella Day, known as Florida's Diamond Lil, was succeeded in purchasing the property. She purchased this property because she thought that there was something marketable there. Of course, there, there are natural springs there. Um, if you've been to Fountain of Youth, there's, there's a gurgling spring. There's springs everywhere here. I mean, it's, there's springs everywhere. If there weren't house foundations and plumbing and all of those things and concrete and sidewalks, there'd be spring taps everywhere. Anyway, so she purchased it in 1900 and um, because she thought that she could hawk it and market it to the global public. In 1909, the cross was rediscovered. And I am pretty sure that that's the photo you're looking at. I don't think that that's the photo of the 1874. I think that is the 1900, 1909 discovery. So she had something that she could market. And she did. She opened the Fountain of Youth and hawked it and hacked it and made a lot of money and made a lot of enemies and made a lot of friends and made a lot of money. And then in 1927, she died in a car accident. Hmm, suspicious. Because later that year, not even a year after the poor woman passed away, a gentleman by the name, maybe we shouldn't call him gentleman, of Walter Frazier purchased the Fountain of Youth. <sighs> and continued to hawk it. And it was a big deal. And it still is a big deal. It's is ridiculous to me, I think, now as it was then. In 1934, the burial grounds were found. And if you've been here, you know that there's a portion where, of course, all of the, the bones have been removed, but uh, they have preserved the land itself where the burial was. It was an organized burial. It wasn't just bodies laid higgledy-piggledy or a, a mass grave, it was, it was a very organized burial of um, Caucasian and indigenous people, uh, very well organized facing north. And everything changed after that, after the burials were found Obviously, there was national attention, and the Fountain of Youth really became something not just regional, and still is to this day. I just want to give a shout to the two archaeologists who have been responsible in present times for maintaining a lot of this, and actually the woman who was responsible for finding the 
ruins at Fort Mose, which I did my last video on, is that's Dr. Kathy Deacon at Flagler College and also Dr. Carl Halbert, who have been key in things going on here in this area. So this is the original position of the statue of Father Lopez. He's the guy who back with Menendez was supposed to have offered the first Catholic service the day they landed. And so in relation to this photo, this is where it stood originally and where the uh, base still stands. Um, he was pointing to the cross as now, instead of now, he's looking backwards toward the cross. So this is the front gate when you come in the front gate. This is the historical marker that's out on the door, out on the street. I'll let you read that. There again, another, another shot of the front entrance, the fountain. I, I did not look up when the fountain was installed. Uh, sorry about that. I just realized that I didn't look that up, but there's the cross. And I took that picture um, that's standing, oops, that is standing on the grass by the museum, which is right next to the chapel, across the body of water, which is a natural body of water, but that has clearly been reinforced, and the cross. And even now you can see um, there's stuff here that wasn't there before. And Father Lopez statue has been moved. It used to be right there. Okay. So now last year, the Catholic Church coronated Our Lady of La Leche, meaning that a crown was placed upon her head and the statue. And you'll see in some of the photos I have, she is crowned. If you go to the website, you will see she is crowned and the baby Jesus who is nursing in her arms is also crowned. So that was done last year. It was a big deal, man. You couldn't get in this neighborhood. It was such a big deal. Uh, yeah, that happened. Let me get the date. October 21st, 2021. Yes, she was crowned. Since that time, this whole area that is on the little strip where the actual cross is, has been built up at a crazy pace. Before that, there was nothing, there was a walkway, that was it. There was nothing, there was an old mosaic of um, Guadalupe and some historical markers, but there was nothing else. And since the coronation, the area around the cross and what is currently under the trees has just exploded. And I am not lying when I tell you every two weeks, there's something new every there. So this is one of the new things. There are these four pillars with, I guess are blue calcite orbs on top of them with you know, this, the cross and the bar, there's writing on all four sides and you see this geometric pattern. There are four of these in the area that is behind the grotto monument. So there's a close up. Isn't it sad? They have to uh, secure them to the concrete. I think that's horribly sad. 
but there's there's all this written information and there are are four of these large pillars in these geometrical patterns another angle i think i got all four i think that's what i did i just got all four now here we go here's the grotto so there she is she's crowned and she's nursing jesus and he's crowned and behind here and this is all under the trees is this walkway there are 40 of these small pillars with small balls and then there are four of these big pillars with big balls i don't know anything about catholicism i don't know how the stations of the cross work or anything about that there are 10 pillars with balls between all four of the big pillars. I don't know anything about gematria or numerology. Somebody was telling me that uh, four is um, fighting the feminine. I don't know anything about that, but it's just, it's, it's beautiful here, but it's so eerie and it just gets more and more Masonic every week. So if I'm standing looking at Jesus on the cross, directly behind me is the big cross. In fact, there's a video that I took in this slideshow where I'm my can't my phone's focusing on this and I turn around and the cross is behind me. So if you walk directly across the grass from the cross, from across from the cross, you come to this little grotto area which the first thing you see is Jesus on the cross. And then behind him, you see behind him is the grotto with Mary. And then all the poles with the blue balls start. And you walk. I don't know what it is you're walking. I don't know. It's some, I have seen people walking this, holding their hands in certain ways and doing some kind of prayer so i know it means something in catholicism but i'm i'm ignorant and here is so this is right behind that statue of jesus and there are the balls to mary and you see this wonderful sacred geometry turned evil and then you walk around here, back here. And yeah, there's another of the large ones. So there are four of those. And then there are, there are four of these. And then there are 10 of these in between them. Now, in some places, they have erected this wall. I'm not sure why they erected these walls. It's in more than one place. Uh, some kind of privacy, in this case, protecting the tree. I'm not sure why these walls were erected here, but I think that it's interesting that they chose a pattern that's like um, uh, at uh, some of the ancient sites right where we question how did these neolithic people create this construction how about brown's gas anyway um yeah i guess they're for privacy i don't know um but you know the pattern there's just no coincidences masons masons So there you see, I took that last week. And then here is this area here. The trees have been planted since the early photos, obviously. And I don't know if you can see from here, but there are 12 stations of the cross around here now. 
you can see that one and that one, 12 Stations of the Cross. And there are also 12 concrete indentations, six on each side. Uh, I have no idea what those are for, but uh, it all becomes creepier and creepier. Here's an example of one of the Stations of the Cross. Another one. And excuse my shadow, but that's me uh, standing in front of one of the concrete inlays there, uh, six on each side. Sizable, I don't know what's gonna go there. Again, I don't know about numbers. I don't know about Catholicism, but it's all very ritualistic and disturbing to me. Another station. This is, this has been here around a while, but they moved it. Um, this is in the circular area there around the cross. Um, it's not where it was originally. Seems kind of out of place. I don't know, though I love Guadalupe. I love the image of Guadalupe. And I especially love the image of Guadalupe when she's dark skinned as she should be, I think. Um, She's not dark skinned here, but anyway, yeah, this is this has been moved from its original position in the old photos. You can see where it was, um, and it it it's odd. It's in an odd spot. Now, perhaps the most Masonic screaming thing is this obelisk here, which is in the circular area of the Stations of the Cross, and between the two crosses. Oh, God. And this is showing you here is the pyramid uh, obelisk. Of course, there's an obelisk by across. And then it's in line with that station of the cross. And that's the station of the cross that it's in line with. There you can see it back there. Another station of the cross. So that's the current place where he was moved to, Father Lopez. That was built in 1958 of bronze. There's a plaque that talks about the construction of that and the artist. Built in 1958, uh, before the cross was erected. The cross was erected in 1966. So think about the statue was here before the cross and it was placed where it was placed at a time when they thought that that was the most appropriate place. Um, I can tell you, that where it was in relation to how things would have been then is it's on the it was on the patch of land where the current Our Lady of La Leche Cathedral is. Um, of course, it's the third one. The original one was burned. The second one was burned. The, the third one was burned. Um, but the one that is standing now, he was facing the back of that cathedral and between him and the cathedral is the old cemetery, a beautiful old holy cemetery that I'm very upset by the fact that people just walk all over and take pictures on. But that's where he stands now, not where he stood originally. And that's about the statue and the artist. So we're over now, away from the cross, we're over now where the current Lady of La Leche Chapel is. This is right across 
the pathway from the front door. And um, there is a walk, a paved walk around here that has the seven sorrows of Mary altars. And um, they all look like this. So that's what Our Lady of the Leche looks like now. I didn't walk in because I, I'm not Catholic and I kind of feel like if I walk in somebody else's church to take pictures, that's incredibly disrespectful. Whether I believe it or not, it's just incredibly disrespectful. But, but uh, to the left and the right of here, are uh, the old uh, tombstones, and um, we are to uh, we believe that the bodies are still interned there. I believe that they are. Um, energetic work I've done indicates to me that the bodies are still buried there. So this is uh, the last one that was built in 1911. Um, and it was made to look older than it was obviously, because so many had been destroyed through fires and attacks and such. It's very lovely. It's very beautiful inside. Um, you can pop up lots of photos of what it looks like inside. Really, really beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Though such a strange vibe here because so much life has been lost and um, I think there's uh, geomancy going on. I do. I, 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 yeah. I think that there's uh, stuff going on here. Here's one of the uh, Seven Sorrows of Mary stations. This is facing the Matanzas River. And to the left, this here's some of the old. Uh, headstones, but back here is this horrifying altar. Absolutely horrifying. I still have a hard time walking near this. It is listed as being the site of the first service that Father Lopez was to have uh, held and where they held their services until they built their church. Well, first of all, of course, the river then was not where it is now. What was land was much farther out into the lagoon. Um, I don't think that all that they did on any altar was just Catholic servicing. I think there was a lot of uh, malicious activity that was done there too. And if you come here with any kind of sensitivity, uh, you will learn the same. So again, there is another one of the Seven Sorrows of Mary Walk. There we go, there's that. And the cross. And again, I don't have a date on this photo, but you can tell by the fact that uh, there's great sparsity around there. And the trees are very different. It was some time ago. I'm thinking it was the 70s. I'm just getting a feeling, looking at the quality of the photo, the color of the sky and everything, and the way the colors registered in the photo, I'm thinking it was the 70s. So this cross, this ridiculous, ridiculous cross was erected in 1966 to mark the 400th year of the establishment of Christianity in the new world. It was supposed to be where Menendez set his first foot and erected his first wooden cross. Of course, we know that's impossible. The coordinates are 29 degrees, 894 minutes, 
west and 81 degrees 314 north. I checked to see what else was on that coordinate and I didn't find a temple of any kind, but a town by the name of Bainang Kanda in Nepal. 70 tons of steel was used in plates and it's packed with concrete to endure hurricanes, which we know are frequent here since four in the colonial days wiped out a good many things. It's 208 feet tall and it is positioned facing north-south. So the center of the column facing north and then south. Hmm. And here the question arises. Now I understand why they decided to put the cross here because it's out on the point. And at that point um, in history, the land was already secured from the river. There was already stone reinforcement and whatnot along the riverbank so that the Matanzas River didn't take any more land. So it was a dramatic point, obviously. It's 208 feet. You can see it from anywhere in the area. If you go up on any of the bridges, you can see it towering over the city and at night it's lit up. So it clearly was not placed where Menendez either set foot or raised his first cross. That location would have been much farther out in what is now the creek, obviously. But this point was chosen for a reason and it was chosen with a north-south alignment for a reason too. That's why I looked to see what else was on that same coordinate somewhere else in the world? <sighs> Geomancy, what can we do? What can we do to use symbols on the land to create magic? This is from my phone. I just did a um, Google Earth shot and you see the coordinates are on the bottom there. And um, I just took this today before I made this video and it shows the grounds around the cross. I don't know when this Google Earth image was taken, but that's not what it looks like now. Um, there is nothing around the cross at the time of this photograph, absolutely nothing. The uh, statue of Father um, Lopez is just right over here. There's a little bridge here and it's just right over here on the other side of the bridge. This is still here. It's a little plaque that tells you about the cross and yada yada. But uh, this is different and there's trees and stuff here. And of course the Stations of the Cross, uh, but you don't see any of that here. So this photo's uh, old, old, I don't know how old, uh, at least seven years old, I'd say. Now under this tree cover here is where that whole cross and grotto and uh, stations that you walk past those blue calcite balls and all that, that's, it's not under here during this photo, there was nothing under here, but um, that's where all of that is now. And this one, I also just took this off of my phone. So we were talking about the Fountain of Youth and the cross that was found in the ground and the shysters that thought that they could sell stuff to the ignorant human beings who were always looking to be entertained and learn something and blah, 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 blah. 
So this is all of it, okay? So this whole area here would have been Siloy Menendez. This was all Menendez's first settlement. All to here. Now it's separate now. You have to pay to go into the Fountain of Youth. This is free, anybody can walk here. But at the time, this was all one big thing. So yeah, so those hundred or so uh, burials that they found here on the Fountain of Youth property in 1934 would have been part of all of this. So just reference point. Um, this right here is called San Marco Drive. It used to be called Shell Road. The uh, Castillo San Marcos is right back here. So this is San Marco Drive. And you come in right here where the current church is. I, I don't even remember what it's called, but uh, the current church is here and right next to it is the museum. And uh, that's this, you come in here and there's the circle and the fountain, which you saw in the earlier photo. That's that. You can park over here and then you can walk across this footbridge. And then in this area here are all of the colonial cemeteries and the shrine of Lady of La Leche, the beautiful old church that is made to look older than it actually is. That's all here and that hideous altar. And then you come this way and you walk over the other little walkway and right there, that dark spot right there, that is the statue, the current uh, location of the statue of Father Lopez. And you walk along here and you come to the great cross. And then around here are the stations of the cross. The Guadalupe is right here. The Masonic uh, obelisk tribute to that Irish priest is here. And then back here under the trees are where the walkway with the 40 balls are. FYI, the original placement of Father Lopez, which is right here now, was right here where, where this, you, you come over the bridge and there's a little place where it kind of juts out and that's where Father Lopez was. In fact, you can kind of see there's something really dark here. That's the old granite um, platform that the original Father Lopez, that the Father Lopez statue was originally on. Remember that was placed in 1958. The cross was not erected until 1966. But again, this was all part of that. Now back here, these are all homes. What's left of the Fountain of Youth area is here. Again, this was all part of the settlement at the time. So where these homes are, you know, they could potentially be on indigenous grave sites. We don't know. But um, this is all the Fountain of Youth, and uh, it's a ridiculous place where they do reenactments with people dressed in ridiculous attire, and they fire black powder weapons and cannons. And um, the coolest thing about this ridiculous place is um, peacocks. They're wild peacocks, and they're kind of like squirrels. They'll walk right up to you because people have been feeding them for decades. But yeah, this was all Siloy Menendez. And of course, other than places where it has been uh, supported to not erode, you would imagine that this has all changed a great deal. Now the Hornbeck that was established after the attack from the North, the Hornbeck was built in 1706. So after James Moore, burned everything down and the additional wall, the Hornbeck wall 
um, I believe was, it, this is San Marco Drive. And if you were to go left right here, across from the entrance, on this street, which I think is called Mission Street, and you just followed it out all the way to the San Sebastian River. That's where I believe the Hornbeck was. But sadly, as I said, there's absolutely no notation anywhere of it. I mean, there are homes there that are built on the foundation of that wall, which it's heartbreaking to me. So this is the current church. This is what it looks like now. And again, you can see, I mean, it's destitute. There's not much here. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff here now, but there's not much there then. And you can see right there is the original placement of um, Father Lopez statue. And yeah, that's what it looks like at night. Uh, pretty spectacular. Um, a lot of magic being cast off of that. Uh, Cross, I believe. Yeah, again, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking it's like the 70s, a 70s photo based on the way the colors look. Um, but see, there's just, there's people, you see people walking around, but there's, there was nothing over there but the cross. See, there's nothing back here then, nothing, absolutely nothing. It was just a real pretty peaceful chill out place, but all that was over there was the cross. And again, this is a little more recent. You see how the wall's been reinforced here. But still, there's nothing there. It's just the cross. Yeah, the lights have been installed. And again, I showed you this before. Um, this was the wall that was built um, as a secondary reinforcement. This is Castillo San Marcos. This is our star fort. This is the road that I was telling you about. Uh, it's now called San Marcos. This is the southernmost point of the old city wall, the Kubo line and the moat that connected the Matanzas River to the San Sebastian River. This is what we now call Orange Street. So this was the reinforcement that in the future help to protect the, uh, the Menendez. Of course, Menendez wasn't there anymore, but Nombre de Dios, we'll call it that, that helped protect that. So all the homes that are here now, interesting, you know, they're all built on a filled in moat and the old, this old ramification. I don't know, I would wanna know that. I just recently learned about this horn line. I didn't know anything about that. I would be so, so, so interested to find out more about that. There's not much, I mean, I think I'm gonna to have to, go to the history department at the Flagler College or something. Yeah, I just live up the way <laughs> from here. And you already saw that, that's erecting the cross in 1966. So there it is. We've come to the end of that. That was a lot of information. I gave you a lot of dates and la di da, but it comes back to the questioning of all the symbols and all the numbers. And do you think that there's magic being operated here with all of this? Why did they choose 208 feet for this cross to stand? 
Why do you think? And why did they pick that exact longitudinal, latitudinal alignment to place it there? And what is up with all of that geometry and Masonic ordering of balls and crosses at the foot of the cross? And why did they wait until the coronation was over of Our Lady of La Leche to start constructing all of the Masonic geometry? I don't know. I mean, what do you think? I don't know. It's mysterious stuff, but there's a lot there for you to ponder. I thank you for hanging out with me for this long video. I hope I gave you some interesting things to consider. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>